Thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, I'm Andrew Wiley, I'm a partner at uh, Bureau Happold. I uh, sit on our UK board and uh, am responsible for the businesses transformation and response to the climate emergency. Um, I'm delighted to be able to uh, ever so briefly introduce Dr. Natasha Watson. I've worked with, uh, with Natasha over more than a decade um, from uh, uh, supporting and uh, sponsoring her uh, engineering doctorate um, through to the work that she's been leading on uh, educating and transforming our, uh, our business. Um, Bureau Happold have, uh, like many businesses, committed to, uh, to making change through uh, Engineers Declare and, uh, and declaring um, and making commitments to uh, reduce the uh, uh, impact of the, of the work that we do. Um, through uh, um, committing to science-based reduction targets um, and in the field of um, embodied carbon that is a 50% reduction in embodied carbon in all of the design work and uh, uh, that we that we undertake um, on 2020 levels by the year 2030 um, and to do that we need uh, we need to all be pulling in the same direction working with our collaborators to help uh, help us uh, um, achieve this uh, uh, this impact um, um, are furnished with uh, uh, good understanding and the appropriate tools, but then most importantly, understanding how to go about making change. And I'm delighted that that's what Natasha is going to be talking to us all about. So, keeping it uh, discipline agnostic to the best of my ability. Um, but because of my background in this area has been mainly based in structures, there will be um, a bit more sort of structural leaning to maybe some of the examples or um, those kinds of things. So, right, so I will be uh, covering sort of the increased focus on the climate emergency so that we're all on the same page here. Um, then talking about what embodied carbon actually is, um, then sort of diving deeper into, you know, how do you measure it? What systems do you look at? What data, what targets do we have? And then towards the end, um, I'll be talking about sort of key ways of how we can reduce our embodied carbon. Um, brief introduction as to what's next for us and then a summary of uh, the key things that I've uh, talked about. But first, um, we have a poll. So um, how would you rate your knowledge of embodied carbon? Is it completely new, some basic knowledge, understand subject well, or consider yourself an expert? Um, we'll have a, a couple of seconds to, uh, to fill that in and kind of gauge the room. Um, I'm kind of expecting there'll be um, people closer to the completely new and basic knowledge uh, if you've dialed into this, um, but yeah. We'll be sharing the results once we've gotten to around about an 80%. Okay, cool. So um, some basic knowledge, that's that's cool. I think uh, when I gave this um, last year, there were a couple of people who were much more on the, uh, are completely new to the subject. So um, yeah, hopefully um, I'll be able to expand that, uh, that knowledge base that you have there. Thanks very much. Right, so. The increasing focus on the climate emergency. Um, the fact that we're giving this presentation online um, really shows how disruptive um, COVID-19 and the pandemic has been on the way we work, the way we approach uh, buildings, the way we, um, the way we live our lives. And um, we need to kind of understand that feeling and understand how disruptive it has been to actually fully appreciate how uh, the climate emergency um, will disrupt um, our lives even more. And also it is disrupting now people who live uh, in areas where they've seen like the most extreme uh, temperature ranges, um, wildfires, increased flooding and those kinds of things. 
Um, as a result of those, uh, there is obviously very high public concern and there have been um, over 100 countries that have signed up for net zero commitments um, and nationally determined contributions, so agreed targets for um, carbon emissions um, there and then also uh, that is reflected in the UK as well. Um, with COP26 ongoing, the number of Britons uh, that said that the environment is a top national issue reached record levels for that and then when you've got public concern you have political concern so uh, for the 2019 uh, general election in the UK we had the first ever climate debate and um, I'm expecting that when we do get to uh, sort of general elections in the next couple of years it will be a topic that will be much uh, sort of uh, debated as well um, amongst our uh, political leaders then when we've got uh, public and political concern, typically you get uh, banks interested here. So um, banks are committed to net zero carbon, but what does net zero carbon actually mean? It's when zero carbon emissions are achieved through balancing carbon emitted with the equivalent emissions that are offset. So this is uh, where you emit your carbon emissions, um, you then calculate how much those were, and then you purchase carbon offsets so that you get to a net level of zero. So with this, um, recently, I think in the last sort of two years or so, the United Nations Environmental Programme Finance Initiative um, set up the Net Zero Banking Alliance and currently 43% of global banking assets have signed up for this. Um, and because of that, uh, achieving net zero emissions, every company, every bank, every insurer will need to adjust their business models to take this into account. Um, with, the, uh, with that alliance and with the financial initiative uh, last year, guidelines for climate target setting for banks was also set out. And if you delve into that as well, sector level targets are going to be set for um, things such as cement production, commercial and real estate, and also iron and steel production as well. So I think as a response to this as well, um, asset owners are committed to net zero carbon. So the Better Buildings Partnership has been going from strength to strength um, with signatories uh, there that you can see on the right hand side. I think we've got a couple of people um, who are with those organisations on the call today. And um, the, building better, uh, the Better Building Partnership has uh, sort of set guidance for net zero carbon pathways um, for these companies as well. And some of the work that we've been doing has been helping um, these companies realize what that looks like um, on their projects. And then also carbon targets will be increasingly required for planning permission. Um, the London plan that was released uh, last year and um, uh, embodied carbon assessment guidance that was released for um, within London as well. Um, there has been policies saying major developments should be net zero carbon and then also you need to take into account um, a whole life cycle carbon emissions for any new developments as well if they're happening in London. Um, but what do we mean by whole life cycle carbon emissions? So whole life carbon is actually the uh, sum of operational carbon emissions. So these are emissions from the operating of a building. So heating, power, lighting, etc., plus the embodied carbon of a building. So this leads us into what exactly is embodied carbon? So embodied carbon refers to the greenhouse gases emitted during manufacture, transportation, construction, maintenance, and disposal of materials used to construct a building or construct an asset of sorts. So uh, including pieces of infrastructure, bridges, those kinds of things. And despite referring to carbon dioxide, CO2, um, that is not the only gas that contributes to global warming. Um, here you can see on the right hand side, this is a, a, a table of different um, embodied, uh, different greenhouse gases uh, that um, contribute to global warming. Um, however, we do use uh, carbon equivalents, so CO2e, um, to measure this global warming potential. And it is uh, relative for these different um, kinds of uh, greenhouse gases that you can see here. Um, 
so methane, um, which, you know, is produ produced quite a bit in, from um, agriculture and farming, um, that can be considered, one molecule of methane can be considered 25 times as bad as one molecule of um, carbon dioxide uh, in the air for its global warming potential. Um, there are a couple of uh, uh, greenhouse gases there that you might not be as familiar with, but they are uh, present within uh, the building uh, industry. So SF6, so sulfur hexafluoride right at the bottom there, is a really good insulator and it's actually used in electrical switch gear. And that has an impact of 22, over 22,000 times as much as uh, carbon dioxide. Um, and then also nitrogen trifluoride as well, that's used in semiconductors and um, LCD screens, and that is 17,000 times as bad as uh, carbon dioxide. So um, thankfully, you know, these kinds of things are starting to come out a bit more now, and, you know, our MEP systems, et cetera, we're, we're looking at the impact that these have um, on our uh, embodied carbon of our buildings as well. So where can it come from? It can come from several different sources, and those include chemical processes, so this could be things like refrigerant leakages, um, but also the breaking down of limestone into cement. Um, it can come from transportation emissions, so uh, taking your raw materials to a uh, factory to be processed, that has um, emissions associated with that, and as you can see here, freight flight is much worse than um, things such as rail and um, uh, shipping containers uh, by sea. And then also it can come from uh, the energy and heat required for processing and manufacturing. So this could be um, the firing of bricks, the creation of um, uh, semiconductors and chips and things like that as well. So putting embodied carbon into context, um, the UK annual um, carbon emissions were 414 uh, megatons of CO2e and that was in 2020. And of that, the UK built environment is responsible for around about 40% of that. On a slightly more granular scale, a return flight from the UK to New York is 1.67 uh, tonnes of CO2. Um, a train ride from Bath to London return is um, uh, around about 1% uh, of that, 0.016 tonnes. And a combination of these kinds of things, plus uh, your diet and uh, things like that, um, give an average uh, UK carbon footprint of around about 11 tonnes of uh, CO2e. Um, around about one metre cubed of reinforced concrete is 0.5 tonnes of CO2e. And if we were to scale this up to, uh, to give a 6,000 metre squared office building, um, that would be around about 4,000 tonnes of CO2e as well. And then when you marry these together, um, one office building could be the equivalent of the annual emissions of 363 people. So we've got 81 people on this call, um, you know, kind of triple that. And then you might actually be um, thinking about that's a lot of carbon emissions from people. Um, we have a a massive scope to um, really make a difference with uh, carbon emissions uh, in our professional life in a way that we can't necessarily um, do in our sort of personal choices here. So um, I think this really highlights the importance of um, our design decisions um, on our projects. But where exactly in um, a concrete building or a bu any building really is the embodied carbon? So uh, if we look at a speculative Cat A office in London, um, embodied carbon typically makes up two thirds um, of uh, the total carbon of that building with operational carbon being the remaining third. Um, from that, around about 50% of that embodied carbon comes from superstructure and substructure um, with the remaining bits being sort of cladding, um, MEP, fit out, transport, etc. And then from within fit out as well, um, that uh, takes into account sort of furniture, floor finishes, partitions, etc. cetera. Um, when looking at this breakdown, it kind of really hits home as a structural engineer, how much um, I have an impact on these different kinds of things. Um, not only the sort of the direct impact of the 50% uh, superstructure and substructure, but um, the sort of setting out of um, uh, of my of my designs can impact the MEP, it can impact the cladding, um, impacts partitions and floor finishes, etc. as well. 
So if we look at this, um, this pie chart, it's not a static pie chart. Um, operational carbon has been steadily decreasing as a result of um, energy efficiency improvements um, and legislation over the last 30 years. Um, its emphasis in BRIAM and LEED and other sustainability assessment methods, but also, uh, and definitely in the UK, um, our increasingly renewable energy mix. And so as we go forward um, in the coming years, we will see the impact of embodied carbon um, only increase as, uh, as we move more and more into renewables and this sort of operational um, section of the pie chart decreases. So coming into uh, talking about embodied carbon as a system, um, I will be taking you through um, uh, the different modules that some of you may have uh, heard about. So modules A, B, C and D when people talk about embodied carbon. Um, hopefully I'll be able to explain uh, what that actually means uh, in terms of uh, building components um, and infrastructure as well. So if we start off with our raw material supply, um, that is an embodied carbon emission and um, the module uh, is called A1 and that's uh, in accordance with uh, BSEN 15804. So that's the, the British standard um, by which we uh, calculate and categorise uh, embodied carbon emissions. So if you were to take a building component from its raw material supply, and then take it from, from where it's been either quarried or a forest or those kinds of things and transport it to where it needs to be processed. That is uh, That transportation is called module A2 and that sort of processing um, is module A3. So that's um, from what you saw earlier with the slides, the heating, um, the sort of um, energy needed to say process um, a, a piece of, um, iron ore into pig iron or um, those kinds of things. Once you've gotten your um, uh, element processed, uh, you can then potentially transport it and manufacture it into components. So say um, taking that sort of uh, stock iron and uh, taking it to a mill where it can become say a steel beam. Um, once you've got that steel beam, and then you're using it to transport, uh, you're then transporting it uh, to a construction site. That transportation of that steel beam from the factory to the site is called module A4. And then all of the energy and requirements that are uh, the carbon emissions associated with construction and installation, that's called module A5. So once you've gotten past module A5 and you've got your complete building, you then have um, all of the different B modules. So uh, the B modules are everything to do with the operation of a building. Um, modules B1 to B5 are about the embodied carbon that goes into the operation of that building. So all the additional material that you might need to put, uh, put into the building for uh, maintenance, repair, replacement. So if we say had a steel beam um, and it needed to be repainted after 15 years, um, that uh, the carbon emissions from that amount of paint would be um, considered uh, one of these sort of B modules there. Um, we also have modules B6 and B7, so operational energy use and water use, and that's where the operational carbon comes in. Then when a building potentially reaches its uh, end of life, um, material is then uh, transported away from, uh, from site and it is processed. Um, uh, that's module C3 and the actual act of deconstructing a building um, is uh, module C1. So uh, those are those C modules. And then if anything does get disposed of, um, the act of that disposal is called module C4. So uh, the C modules, C1 to C4, are all about what happens at the end of that building's usable life. Um, hopefully we don't get that many uh, bits of materials going into disposal. And instead, hopefully we can uh, recover some of, that, uh, some of that material. So either it's recycling potential or recovery potential. And um, that is covered by module D. So these are considered benefits outside of the building system itself. And then that material can hopefully make its way back into the, um, into the chain and uh, be used to manufacture more components in the future. So 
if we look at modules A1 to A3 specifically, uh, that is called uh, the cradle to gate. So some of you may have heard uh, that phrase before. Uh, cradle to gate um, means uh, anything that's considered um, uh, the carbon emissions considered from that raw material supply to the factory gate, um, so modules A1 to A3. Um, if we're just looking at modules A1 to A5, that's called cradle to practical completion. So that's everything from, um, like I said, the forest or the, uh, the quarry to um, handing over that final building. And then if we look at everything in its entirety, that can be considered cradle to cradle or whole life carbon. Uh, there as well. So if we look at uh, infrastructure, infrastructure is uh, typically looked at slightly differently. However, uh, and, and we take into account um, the uh, sort of the system boundary set out by uh, a standard called PAS 2080 for this. Thankfully, um, it's pretty much the same for a majority of the A, uh, A to D modules there. However, when we look at uh, PAS 2080 specifically, they also have another um, A module, so A0. These are the preliminary studies and consultations. Um, the carbon emissions associated with A0 are typically um, the energy use for these uh, sort of case studies and transportation demands for, say, getting consultants to site or those kinds of things. And then there are also two other um, B modules, um, the other operational processes. So these might be, say, uh, the chemicals used in the treatment of water for, an, uh, for a water treatment plant and the uh, carbon emissions associated with that. And then B9 is actually the user's utilization of infrastructure. So um, for, say, a road, this will be the, um, the carbon emissions associated with the vehicles that typically um, go over it. So um, moving on now to the actual specific data, now that I've managed to um, communicate what those different modules are. Um, the embodied carbon calculation is actually quite a simple calculation, if I do say so myself. You've got your material quantity typically, and then you've got your embodied, well, you've got your carbon rate per unit, and then you multiply those together and you get a quantity of, uh, of carbon emissions from that. So your material quantities can either come from a bill of quantities, a Revit model, or even just sort of a hand sketch and a hand calc. Uh, your embodied carbon uh, rates per unit, these can be um, either from the inventory of carbon and energy version 3.0, uh, if you're looking at um, kind of general materials uh, there. And then there's also the C CES MM4 carbon and price book um, produced by the ICE. Um, for different elements as well that might not necessarily be covered by the inventory of carbon and energy. Um, if you're looking at a specific product, um, then typically you can look at environmental product declarations. So these are life cycle assessments conducted for um, specific products by specific manufacturers so that you can, um, you can uh, see what the embodied carbon um, of those particular products is. Um, with the release of the new um, sort of guidance that um, sets out how these environmental product declarations should be uh, conducted, um, we'll be moving from um, an A1 to A3 module minimum um, to uh, manufacturers and uh, suppliers needing to provide uh, data for C1 to C4 and with D as well, and that will be released um, later this year. For um, the kind of embodied carbon rates per unit for transport as well, um, typically you can use um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, the Bayes rates from, uh, from the government, or um, there are other sort of databases for different transportation emissions um, with different modes as well. Then when we look at the um, CO2 quantity, typically we talk about, um, for buildings anyway, we talk about uh, kilograms of CO2e per meter squared of GIA. And that's what we output um, within our uh, structural embodied carbon calculator that we've set up um, within Bureau Happold. Um, we could look at total kilograms of CO2e as well. And that's what we uh, report um, within our uh, within our embodied carbon tracker 
um, within Bureau Hapold as well. And then um, you could potentially look at uh, communicating embodied carbon in slightly different ways as well. Um, could we look at um, kilograms of CO2e per seat if we're looking at stadia projects? Um, could we look at it as per volume of clean water after one month of operations for one for water treatment plants? Um, I think there's a lot more scope in this particular area that I'd want to uh, investigate further this year um, and any comments would be uh, greatly appreciated for that. Um, also, uh, when you're looking at this calculation, there is uh, some guidance on the actual process itself and um, I believe that uh, RICS, a whole life carbon assessment for the built environment was one of the first ones um, to really um, hold your hand and take you through this process. And I still think of it as a really, a really useful document to have a read through if you're sort of starting your embodied carbon journey. Um, I think that the way it's written, it's, it's quite accessible and um, they've got a couple of uh, good, um, good sort of proxies in there for different um, module uh, assumptions as well. Um, there are different tools available um, as well. Um, yes, I've mentioned that Bureau Hapold uh, structures have our own internal um, calculator. We use that more as a um, uh, to help us make decisions and um, look at different options together. Um, however, when we're doing um, embodied carbon calculations for uh, things like planning and for things like BRIAM, we typically use our one-click LCA um, tool because that's independent, independently verified um, uh, tool. Um, that's uh, you know it's, it's it has the rigor in there um, that is needed for things like BRIAM there as well. Um, there is also eTool LCD, um, which uh, is, is an alternative to one click. Um, I must admit, I'm not too uh, sure of the specific differences between them, but uh, again, any feedback if, if some of you have been using eTool uh, would be great. I'd like to know a bit more. Um, and then there are different system processes for different disciplines as well. So uh, last year, the iStruct-T released how to calculate embodied carbon. Um, SIBSI released TM65 for calculating uh, the embodied carbon in building services. And then you have uh, PAS2080 for calculating the embodied carbon uh, for infrastructure projects as well. Um, but yes, just to highlight, if you're new to this journey, please have a look at uh, Rick's um, Whole Life Carbon Assessment. It's free to access. Um, just give it a Google, um, really rate it. So now moving on to measuring embodied carbon and the targets. Um, uh, towards the end of last year, um, there was a, an alignment of um, LETI, so London Energy Transformation Initiative, um, the iStruct-T and the REBA's sort of target setting um, uh, for 2030. Um, this is the um, target setting for the embodied carbon. So this is A1 to A to C uh, modules. Um, however, for structures, um, we believe that um, it, it wasn't necessarily appropriate for us now. Um, the reason being is that it's hard to ascertain exactly what will happen in 60 years and also the carbon emitted now um, we believed was more important than carbon emitted in 20 or 30 years time when innovation and policy will greatly change our assumptions. I mean we're already seeing um, uh, the benefits of uh, the greening of our grid on the embodied carbon of things like uh, steel um, uh, steel sections. So um, we thought that, you know, having a look at um, modules A, B and C um, for our targets uh, was inappropriate. Um, instead, what we've uh, done is we've looked at the upfront carbon, so um, that cradle to practical completion, modules A1 to A5, and we've used um, these for our targets. Um, just to note that sequestration, so this is uh, the benefits that you can get um, from uh, using timber, can't be taken into account when we're looking at upfront carbon um, because uh, the trees that were uh, cut down for this particular building um, 
haven't uh, been replaced yet and so you can't take that uh, carbon into account. If you want to know more about sequestration, please let me know and we can have a, a bit more of an in-depth discussion about it because I feel like I won't be able to do it justice in uh, one or two minutes. Um, so uh, from that particular set of targets, um, we've taken the fact that um, superstructure and substructure is around about 50 to 60 percent of that um, that number and uh, used that to calculate um, potential targets uh, for for structures um, and using the scores rating which is the I struct T rating um, we've given um, ourselves uh, a set of targets based on this um, we've got a 2030 target of of a B rating, we've got a, um, a basic minimum of an E rating, and we've got an average or like a, a target um, for 2025 as well. And so that has given us our um, our targets that we have within um, within structures. Um, from now, we are targeting a minimum performance of uh, 350 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. Um, we're targeting um, 250 kilograms and then we've got an aspiration for 2030 to be um, sort of achieving 200 uh, kilograms or less on our projects. And this, um, this does align up um, with our um, wider Bureau Happel targets of reducing the embodied carbon intensity of all of our new buildings, major retrofit, retrofits and infrastructure by, by 2030 by 50%. Um, I'm also going to include, um, this is currently with our 51 projects within our embodied carbon calculations. Um, this is where we are now and I feel like um, a lot of companies will have um, a similar breadth of uh, projects that they've uh, done their embodied carbon calculations for and, um, and I think that it's important for us to show that yes we've got some rather large outliers in there as well. And I think that um, as we talk more and more about embodied carbon and uh, understand where we can make our, um, where we can make a difference, I'm hoping and I'm confident actually that we will see um, this very uh, disparate spattering of um, different embodied carbon for projects uh, really uh, get to our target for 2030. Um, it's, uh, you know, there, there is so much that we can do as designers, but then there is so much that's also being uh, done and being started by our supply chain as well. And it's from all of us moving in this right direction that we'll be able to see um, a much more accelerated change um, because we all have our part to play here. So moving on to how to reduce the embodied carbon of your projects. Um, I think the really key thing here, uh, regardless of um, what discipline you're in and what sort of your scope of uh, influence is, is that the earlier that you tackle embodied carbon, the bigger the potential savings. Um, and I think that uh, that is one sort of key takeaway I'd like you to, uh, to have from this talk. Um, Using that, uh, using that graph, um, we've kind of distilled uh, uh, that into sort of five different um, approaches for embodied carbon reduction um, in order of uh, importance, I believe. So this is reuse over new build, challenging the brief, specifying for low embodied carbon, designing efficiently, and then designing for deconstruction as well. So the first one, reuse over new build, um, or better yet, don't build. Um, there's a really um, interesting uh, free to access paper um, written by Tim Eibel, James Norman and Oliver Broadbent uh, in the iStructi um, where I think that they much more eloquently than I could um, say uh, uh, the benefits of uh, not building anything um, and uh, I think it's a really um, powerful piece so please, please give that one a read. Um, I believe that this approach is actually quite UK centric or at least global north centric um, because we already have quite densely populated cities and uh, vacant properties. Um, uh, and September 2019, there were over 600,000 empty buildings um, of 
of that number, over uh, 440,000 were residential and over 170,000 were commercial. And um, I think that uh, that is something that we can learn uh, from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic from. It's really changed our relationship with the built environment. Um, something that uh, Will Arnold has said before is that he's been working in uh, his his bedroom and uh, that's his office, but it's designed for a uh, residential loading of 1.5. And yet we design our offices for um, two and a half, three kilonewtons per meter squared loading. So um, I think it's, it's, re it's a really good opportunity to take pause and actually understand what do we need our buildings to do. And, um, and with that in mind, um, I'd really encourage everyone here to interrogate the brief, interrogate, do you really need a new building to achieve what you, uh, what you are setting out to do? Or can you um, do changes to an existing building um, uh, to really achieve the solution that you need? Um, so this could be, uh, for example, using an existing building more effectively. Um, this screenshot is uh, from our analytics team within Bureau Hapold. Um, this was uh, towards the early stages of the um, pandemic and uh, they were looking at um, how you can use existing office spaces and maybe just change around a couple of partitions so that you can achieve your sort of two meters social distancing and uh, what kind of occupancy should we be um, looking at uh, for different spaces for that. So that's, uh, you know, a really light touch um, way of um, achieving what, uh, what, what we needed, but also not necessarily um, saying that you need x amount of more space uh, to keep people two meters apart it was um, just really considered and clever ways of using existing space um, so that uh, you can keep social distancing um, at, at appropriate levels uh, in an existing building um, another way of reusing over new build um, this is an example uh, this is lakeshore um, where an old um, uh, I think it was tobacco, um, tobacco set of offices has been um, uh, transformed into, into flats uh, on the outskirts of Bristol. So um, the existing uh, steel frame uh, was retained um, and the building was changed from a sort of a deep plan office. Um, a, a central atrium was kind of punctured out um, of the middle so that there was adequate daylighting for um, for its change of use into residential properties. And um, sometimes it isn't possible to reuse um, the superstructure. Um, and uh, it might be then a case of only being able to reuse foundations. And I think that um, this is something that uh, we really need to do more and more of, especially in um, areas such as London or other sort of more densely populated cities where it might be even more of an issue to try and thread new foundations uh, between the uh, existing foundations of previous developments that have happened um, uh, in that area as well. Um, there is guidance there and our ground engineering team um, have done these kinds of things before. So um, yes, I really want this to uh, become almost the, um, uh, the business as usual that we reuse foundations if there are foundations in the ground. Secondly is challenge the brief. I did touch on that um, uh, a little uh, with point one, but um, I think one of the key things that um, we're seeing time and time again um, with, with challenging a brief is that um, if you can decrease your structural grid, um, regardless of whether or not you're building out of concrete, steel or timber, um, you can make quite significant savings on the embodied carbon of your superstructure and substructure as well. Um, this is because floor systems, um, unlike sort of beams and columns, uh, they're quite inefficient because they are trying to keep you from falling to the floor below. Um, if it was, if we were being really efficient, we'd all be walking along on beams. Um, and because we've got uh, floor systems, there's a lot of material in there. Um, any any way that you can uh, ensure that that floor doesn't work as hard um, means that uh, you're saving that uh, that additional material um, uh, 
and so as you can see from these uh, from these studies it has a very marked impact on uh, the embodied carbon per meter squared um, again regardless of what material you're using um, another point oh sorry another point that I'd like to make is um, uh, decreasing the need of additional material to work around poor design and increasing the different functions one element can perform uh, within reason. Um, I wanted to include that um, diagram on the right hand side uh, because I realised it was quite structures focused, <laughs> my, my advice on the left hand side. Um, but I think um, regardless of what discipline you're in, um, yeah, try not to get uh, uh, your material usage um, in there to try and do gymnastics to work around poor design, you know, take stock, reassess. Um, and um, also, you know, if you can get those materials to um, perform um, more than one function as well, so that you omit um, the need for even more material in your, in your buildings and in your infrastructure, um, that is a good point to um, keep, be aware of as well. Um, number three, specifying for low embodied carbon. I think a really key thing here is that you can't compare a materials and body carbon without considering how much that you need to do a job. Um, you can probably just about see on the left hand side that concrete, when you're looking at it as a, a kilograms of CO2e per kilogram of building material, is actually really low. It's 0.1 in comparison to some of the other materials further up um, on that graph. Um, however, you need 10 times as much concrete um, to, uh, to create a beam that spans seven and a half meters for a set amount of loading than you do timber. And so um, I think it's just being aware of exactly what, um, how you're looking at your embodied carbon of your materials and um, just really making sure that uh, you understand how much is needed to do the job that you need it to do and not looking at it on a per kilogram of building material basis. Point four, designing efficiently. Um, I believe that, um, you know, there is a lot of value in design freezes and uh, creating design optimization stages in our programmes as well. Um, I, I think that this uh, just means that we can all take pause and make more um, uh, um, you know make more optimized uh, decisions on um, our different uh, building elements and designs you know taking the time to process our, our ground engineering um, our uh, ground investigations honing the material um, that is needed for our foundations for um, different elements as well um, with our MEP design, it means that, you know, we've got time to go, actually, maybe this route is now uh, better because of all the different design decisions that had happened before. But um, I know that I'm speaking from experience and I'm sure that it's the experience that several people on this call have had as well. Um, with um, time constraints, things can slip. And I think that um, uh, we all need to campaign for, you know, appropriate programs, design optimization stages within that program so that we have that time to take pause and, and um, ensure that we're being um, really thoughtful with our use of materials on our, uh, on our buildings and in our infrastructure projects as well. Um, on a slightly more maybe exciting note, um, the designing efficiently can mean um, really taking advantage of um, the uh, progress that's been made in 3D printing, but also um, through computational design as well, um, and only putting material where you need it. And um, I'm quite excited about where this is going to uh, take our sort of architectural language as well um, in the future. And then finally, designing for deconstruction. Um, this is uh, so that we can ensure that when we have emitted that carbon, we have uh, created that steel beam, that timber beam, um, that it's only been that it has only <laughs> been created once, and it won't uh, go to waste. Um, and there are a couple of sort of key um, things to look at when looking at circular economy and uh, designing for uh, deconstruction. 
and those are ensuring good record information so that you know when a building is uh, deconstructed at end of life so 25 years 30 years 60 years um, that you have the information maybe even on that um, element itself uh, if it's a steel beam you know mark on uh, what the section size is what the uh, steel grade is so that when it is deconstructed uh, there is um, some confidence uh, that that element is what it says it is. Um, using simple and reversible connections between components as well so that you you don't need to um, demolish you can just simply unbolt um, different elements um, uh, apart from each other. Um, aiming for single material non-composite elements as well this also helps with the sort of the deconstruction um, aspect minimizing the number of different components and materials and also try to eliminate secondary finishes to uh, to those materials as well. So what's next for Bureau Happold? Um, so uh, we're investigating and researching uh, even more with embodied carbon. Um, I feel like uh, my sort of background in structures, I'm now talking to so many of our different disciplines, uh, talking to our acoustics engineers, our facades people, our uh, MEP as well, and um, hoping that we can learn from each other and understand where we can um, have win-win situations as well, where, you know, transdisciplinary um, benefits of uh, uh, looking at embodied carbon together. Um, we're also um, uh, in the process of um, collaborating and connecting all of our different uh, tools so that they can all speak to each other as well um, with our colleagues in the Hong Kong office. Um, so uh, it's an exciting time for that. Um, we're also doing a lot more sort of educating as well. So um, I'm, I'm working on sort of mandatory embodied carbon training for our structures, um, for our structures teams, so that um, everyone, uh, every structural engineer in Bureau Happold can have that, you know, conversation with um, with other project team members and colleagues um, so that we can you know, again, all work together to uh, to reduce uh, the embodied carbon of our of our buildings and infrastructure projects. Um, measuring and evaluating, I inputted to the iStructees how to calculate embodied carbon guide, um, and um, uh, it was a yeah, it was really good to get involved in that kind of stage. And even now, we're we're talking about you know how how things can be updated. Um, so uh, I'm working on that, but then also with all of our projects, we're, um, we're evaluating the embodied carbon of all of our structural projects at each Re REBA stage and um, really having those conversations about what can be, um, what can be optimized here. Um, have we, have we really um, addressed this particular area as much as we can? Can we make material savings there as well? Um, reporting, we're now um, at 51 projects within our uh, embodied, carbon, um, uh, embodied Carbon dashboard uh, for structures. And um, I know that this will start to, um, this will increase even further, but then also all of our different disciplines as well uh, will start to collate and report uh, on the um, embodied carbon of, of their projects. And then this will feed into um, showing where we are on our uh, journey towards 50% uh, reduction by 2030. And then um, finally, we're sharing um, sharing where we're at, sharing our thoughts, um, much like in this masterclass, but then also um, elsewhere, either through sort of industry press or blog articles and things like that as well. So in summary, um, embodied carbon is increasing in importance as operational carbon continues to decrease. Um, general consensus for buildings is that we should be targeting a total embodied carbon of less than 300 uh, for, for most buildings, 350 for offices um, by 2030 for modules A1 to A5. Um, if you need to embody carbon, please, please, please read the RIC's whole life carbon assessment for the built environment. As I said, it's free to access and I think it's a really good introduction to this uh, topic. Um, I believe that we should calculate embodied carbon for modules A1 to A5 as a minimum. Um, the earlier embodied carbon is discussed, the higher the potential savings. 
reuse existing buildings and infrastructure wherever possible. And you can't compare a materials and body carbon without considering how much is needed to do a job as well. So yes, with that in mind, um, it's on to poll number two. So I think I've got a glamorous assistant. Thank you very much, glamorous assistant. Um, yes, how confident are you to now talk about embodied carbon on your projects? Um, yes, it would be uh, good to know um, how you felt this uh, has been useful for you. And I think we'll um, communicate the results once we're at sort of 80% or so um, uh, responses there. Natasha, thank you so much. I'm just conscious that we've uh, only got a few minutes oh, left. Yeah. <laughs> let, let everybody back um, back on with the rest of their days. Thank you ever so much. Um, I, I've just been I've been monitoring the um, the chat. There are a, a few general questions, but just to, to say that we will be sharing a recording of, of this, um, so you can refresh your memories. Um, yeah. Do look in the chat if you haven't answered the question, because kindly some of the links to um, Syria guides, the um, iStruck T paper by Tim Ibell um, is is in there. Um, uh, as well as a link to the um, to the to the um, Rick's um, uh, paper guide that um, Natasha has referenced, I thought it was fantastic, and I think it was one of the questions here, or one of the points here, just picking up on uh, on um, program, uh, and from it's a it's a point uh, that I've uh, um, held dear, and actually, it, um, oh, there we go, the uh, uh, increased level, increasing levels of confidence. Um, yeah. is, Thank uh, you very much. <laughs> Um, yeah. the, the t investing in time and people's time um, as opposed to investing in materials is what is going to help us on this journey um, exactly. and, and it, it is it is time to, to make sure that we consider the lowest the, the lowest options low, lowest carbon options but actually also do, do not forget we also have um, as professionals we have responsibility um, through the construction phase of, uh, of, of buildings and, and we have to allow allow time for buildings to be built as, as well and um, it's very easy when uh, construction programs are under pressure to uh, to allow higher cement contents so that um, formwork can be struck early and, and, and projects can be brought back onto onto program so uh, knowing about these and being aware of things which can um, uh, unravel the good design work that is done through the construction process is also important to making sure that we have a, um, a good out or we deliver um, lower embodied carbon buildings. Exactly. Um, I think there was a there was a question in here um, uh, about uh, what happened to the, the the rogue outlier that was miles off the top of mm, uh, off yep. the top of the off, off the top of our chart as far as the current uh, logged buildings. Um, this this does that that chart there does um, uh, measure buildings across globally for Bureau of Hapold and and also look at um, at size as well. So there are some uh, um, large projects there as well, but it's all part of. Um, of our, of our learning journey. Yeah, um, that project as well is at Reba stage three. So there is opportunity for reductions there as well. Yeah, very good point. And that, that's an important point is tracking it through the, um, um, th there's a, I'm just uh, looking, continuing to look here. Um, can you expand on carbon sequestration and tree in trees? Um, could you do that in two minutes? In like, two minutes. <laughs> is the question there. Um, yeah. it, is a, it is a big um, project, a, a big topic. And I, I guess what we, we need to reference is, is time that we have a climate emergency now and we need to be um, uh, uh, looking at uh, how best to reduce atmospheric carbon. But sorry, no, exactly. I think, um, so sequestration, um, that's because when you grow a tree, it absorbs CO2. Um, so you have, you potentially have a negative number there. However, when you're using timber in a building, you're not using the CO2 that that tree itself has sequestered. You're banking on the fact that when you have that tree, you're getting it from a suitably managed forest and that forest will replant a tree in that tree's place. And it's the um, carbon that is absorbed by that replacement tree that is growing and absorbing um, over the course of 50 years, that's the sequestration that you can take into account. But that happens 50, 60 years down the line after you've handed your building over. And that's why you can take sequestration into account when you're looking at modules A to C, because you're looking at that whole 50, 60 year timeline. 
and I think that uh, hopefully covers it. <laughs> it, it, it is a, it, yeah. well, well done and, and, and important thing, and, and actually to add to that, um, it's only around 40% of, of the biomass of a tree that actually goes into any exactly. form of long-term um, uh, uh, structural product. The rest of it will either end up very quickly as being used as fuel um, uh, or very short-term um, pro products, which will, which will quite quickly release their, um, uh, that, that um, embodied carbon, um, biomass carbon straight back into the, um, into the atmosphere. Exactly. Um, uh, just one last, I'll take a look at one last question here. How early can we engage architects and try to get them to create work within the constraints of an existing building? One of the main issues with reuse is, is existing building layouts. Um, I, I, I guess that's, a, that's a, a, good, a good discussion, but I think it, it, it comes back to the working, working collectively and, and ensuring that um, Louise, I don't know if you're a, an engineer here, but I, I, um, I think it is, it's, from, from my perspective, it's um, being able to understand the constraints and the opportunities that lie within an existing building before we start to look at how we're going to be able to um, adjust and alter it so that we're working empathetically um, with the building and using the opportunities that, um, that that building yields once we understand it. Um, so the research on the building is so, so critical to, to being able to do that. Exactly. And uh, those conversations, I mean, it's, it's the kind of conversation you can have when you're walking around that existing building that you might have. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of power in actually, as a design team, walking around a space that you have that um, opportunity to develop as well. Um, Thank you. It's, it, uh, on my on my screen here, it's one minute past uh, one. Thank, it. you, okay. thank you, everybody, for for, for joining us. Um, thank thank you for your questions. We'll we'll see that you you have access to um, uh, um, the recording of this. And if there are any other burning questions, do not hesitate to um, get back in contact with Natasha or myself to um, exactly. to discuss. Right. Yep. Thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Cool. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Thank you.